Guys, we are live on the Hawk Zone Rundown with uh, Ryan and Bryce back at it, man. Um, you know what? This is uh, this is a and a episode right here. Uh, like we talked about earlier, uh, you guys are showing us a lot of love and support. We hit that 500 mark. We're continuing to grow. So we want to uh, figure, hey, before the season starts and just, you know, middle of camp here, we get a live Q&A going for you guys and just uh, opportunity for you guys who've been listening on the program and have subscribed and you haven't subbed yet, you know, it's never too late to come on board. And, uh, and so just come on board. Fire away the questions, man. We're here. We're also going to have Dan Vians joining us as well. So that's going to be exciting. And uh, all three of us were just down at uh, Lumen Field over the weekend here uh, during camp. Hawks had their their mock game and and a little different. We're going to dive into that and get into that stuff and what we thought, our thoughts. Uh, you know, we were watching uh, closely and uh, just just the overall vibe too. But Bryce, what's going on, man? Not a whole heck of a lot, man. I'm just excited to do this live Q and A with all of our listeners and subscribers that we've kind of been promising for the last couple of weeks here. So we finally get to dive into that and answer your guys' questions. Um, also, talk with Dan about what we saw at that mock game that we were down there for in Seattle and. There's been some interesting news even today that's come out from Seattle. So we'll talk a bit about that as well. We'll get that going, guys, real quick. Uh, anybody new tuning in, if you haven't subbed yet, go down and hit the subscribe button and like button and uh, the bell so you know when uh, future episodes are coming up. And you know, like this one, we're going live right now. So you guys get to uh, know right away and uh, come on in. And uh, everybody that's been subscribing and showing us love we uh we appreciate it so you know we're gonna let the uh the questions come in but uh hey why don't we uh why don't we just kind of touch touch base a little bit and uh talk about the weekend there pretty cool man mike mcdonald this is the first time he's been involved in this mock game at lumen talk to me about just the overall vibe and the feel of the stadium let people know that maybe weren't there and uh you know, didn't have an opportunity to get in there. What the vibe was like, the feel, uh, just the overall experience that you that you took away, and then I'll, I'll touch base on mine too, man. So for me, I had been to two of the previous Pete Carroll mock games, um, and the big thing that I came away from in comparison of the two was that this one was very structured. It wasn't just a big mock game. Like, they basically took a training camp practice ran it over into Lumen and then added to, you know, the mock game scenarios, but it was more situational football. It wasn't like, here's a kickoff. And then we just drive down the field and go from there. Like a game, it was Seattle. I think their first 11 on 11 situation in this was they were backed up on their one yard line and needed to convert a first down to continue the drive. And so we got to see the ones and the twos and threes kind of go through that scenario. Um, honestly, I really enjoyed the atmosphere that was there there was a lot of people there um and i thought it was a really really good first step in the mike mcdonald era to show how things are going to be a bit different he's very 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 detail oriented and you could see it even with the coaches and the drills they were doing how hands are they are with the with the players and the scheme so i thought that was a really kind of cool aspect to see the change from the pete carroll era yeah absolutely we got dan in the waiting room here we're going to bring him on in live here dan what's going on man what's going on guys how are you we're doing good uh we just got into talking about uh our thoughts over the weekend there we know you were down there as well hanging out with bryce i didn't get a chance to say hi to you guys uh had, had a little guy with me so it was you know yeah, uh, yeah next geez, time so it, was, it was one of those things but we're going to be back down there for for one of the preseason games so uh for sure but yeah we, we were just kind of talking about you know the overall vibe and, and feel different than uh you know say past mock games with pete um what what was your experience like there in uh, lumen field there a couple of days back it was cool uh not for you know a number of reasons not the least of which was getting to sit next to bryce and get his his insight as to what was happening um it took a minute to kind of get comfortable with what was happening because i didn't and, and i know it I wasn't the only one. I don't think Bryce really expected this either. They had created this event, I don't know, four or five years ago. It initially started out at Renton Memorial Stadium. And then I think last year was the first year they did it at Lumen Field. 
and it was a mock game and it was game like conditions. And it was more of just a full controlled scrimmage up and down the field. It took about five minutes for us to figure out, oh, wait a minute, they're not doing that this time. And basically all they did is they just moved practice to Lumen Field. Um, so, you know, once we absorbed that and uh, realized we weren't going to just get to watch 11 on 11 for 45 minutes or an hour or whatever it was, uh, it was pretty cool. And I, And just before I hopped in, I heard Bryce talking about how detail oriented it all seemed to be i've seen a bunch of practices um historically during the time at vmac when pete was here i would go to at least one a season if not two and then i would always go to the public practice at the at the stadium i don't think i've ever seen one that well organized and not to take anything away from pete it was just a different approach um things seemed really really tight and buttoned up you know, players hustled from one period to the next. Uh, you always had, you know, multiple things going on at different ends of the field. Um, it seemed like there was just a lot of energy on the field, and uh, and that was pretty cool. And then, you know, we got to we got to see the players up close. Yeah, I'm with you there too. That was it. Was interesting. You kind of you you get in for you know for people that you know didn't get an opportunity to get in. Another thing is if you guys, you know, the the nice thing is you know the the tickets. You know, you're talking about twelve dollars. You get in yeah. the stadium. You know, like so. So for people who maybe were hesitant, think, oh, you know, this and is going to cost seat. a lot of. Yeah. yeah, you get in there and you, you get a great vantage point. Obviously, interaction with some of the you know some of the players throwing the footballs in the crowd before that you know mock or you know you know practice whatever you want to call it. But it was uh, you know just to get in lumen and you know the music blast and DJs going stuff for the kids later. Like just you know all that for. For 12 bucks i mean you, you know so it's super you know fan friendly family friendly it was it was awesome but but i'm with you man i was kind of waiting around okay when's this mock going then you see the the guys are you know in in the jerseys the whites and the and, and the blues you're like okay we're gonna kick this thing off and then it was just more structures yeah but they had some cool stuff you, you got to see some cool you know the one-on-ones was something that stuck out to me where it was like yeah. over the over the PA, you know, we got, uh, you know, whoever DK going against spoon. And then it was a, a little one-on-one -on -one, and that was cool. Would have been cool to see more of that. But like you said, Mike was running that, you know, discipline structure different than before. And you kind of just got a glimpse of, Hey, this is, this is how we're going to run it. And like you said, everyone was hustling. It, it was, it was serious business, even though it was, you know, this fan environment. Um, before we get into some, some questions and stuff, Bryce, what, what's your overall take? And, you kind of on the same same wavelength as if as far as like hey when are we starting this game oh wait we're going you know yeah no i kind of was in the same thing i thought like because they previously in past seasons it had always been a mock game like it wasn't really a practice it was hey we're gonna run through running out through the tunnel and getting used to that game atmosphere um but for me as much as of a football nerd and dad dan got to see that as how much of a football nerd i am this was awesome for me to be able to watch the structure that they run their practices and truly be able to evaluate some of the guys that we've talked about on all of our shows that, hey, like, are we sure about McClendon Curtis playing right tackle? Well, coming out of this weekend and seeing what was there, I'm not sold on him as a right tackle behind George Fan. I think that's a there's a reason that the Raiders moved him inside because it showed in the situations that they did. Um, and that was the other thing. I love the situational football. Like when they made the offense start, on their one yard line and you've got to convert a first down to get out of there. It's cool to see like how would Seattle's offense and Ryan Grubb call a game in that situation versus what does Mike McDonald's defense do? How much pressure does he bring? How much do they sit back and kind of let the offense kind of feel their way out of that situation? So, you know, those were some really cool aspects, but again, like you said, 12 bucks, like you saw a lot of families there, which when I talked to Dan, he said the year before you didn't see that. So you could sense, I think, the excitement for this entire team, the direction this organization is going now at, at that mock game. And it's got me even more excited for the preseason games even to start. Like before, everyone kind of looks at the preseason and goes, okay, yeah, we'll figure out who's cut and so on and so forth. They don't really pay attention. I'm super dialed in to when Seattle starts that preseason now, more than I have maybe have been in the last couple of years with Pete Carroll. I think there's a couple of things. It's funny, I just got an email right before I hopped on with you guys from, from the Seahawks as a season ticket holder, like a, a survey, like, Hey, what'd you think of football fest? And the one thing that I wish they had done, and, and obviously we all have our own phones. 
and Bryce had a lot of more, a lot more of this committed to memory than I did. But I, I think there's a couple little details that they miss or that they could do better next year. I think they should hand out, they should hand out programs, you know, right. eight and a half by 11 piece, maybe not, you know, super glossy, at least a piece of paper with rosters on it. So we can see who's who, because there's no names on the back of the jerseys, you know, on their practice jersey, at least, at least from what I saw. Um, and it's kind of, in a way, it's almost even harder to tell who these guys are with the guardian caps on. Cause it just, it's one more thing that makes them all look exactly the same, you know? Um, but that's one thing I, I do think I, I, I can see the value of the event just as a whole. Um, you know, Mariners Fan Fest has been a huge hit down here. It's a big, big deal. And I think they could even expand it, you know, make add another hour or two to it. Do some pregame show type stuff, maybe, uh, that would be really fan-friendly. They said, I did see somewhere, I, I commented to Bryce, I thought there were more people there this year. Um, I saw an estimate that there were about 10,000, and I don't think it was anywhere near that. A year ago so uh saw some cool stuff on the field the one thing um the one downside is you know they cracked down and this has been a thing all through training camp no 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 phones no video right. yeah no no photographs no anything and in this environment it made it really difficult to analyze some of the things that we saw you know i had a notepad i was taking notes bryce was taking notes but my god i couldn't even read half of my own yeah, uh, afterwards, because I'm trying to, you know, watch the field, yeah, look wait. down, look up and uh, it, trying to put that together and then not being able to go back and look at it later. You mentioned McClendon Curtis and he struggled from what we saw at right tackle. There was one particular drive, ones on ones, where it was a three and out for the defense. And on the first play, Devin Witherspoon came blitzing off the edge, tipped the ball away. Second play, Mike Morris collapsed the pocket, got pressure on Howell, had to throw the ball away. Third down, Leonard Williams disrupted the play. I think even he got his hand on it or someone else did. Three and out, boom, they're gone. And it was all against McClendon Curtis. So, you know, we looked at each other and like, wow, this is not a good day for him. And then Sam Howell as a whole struggled to move the ball up and down the field. It was the one drive that ended out, ended up, they failed to convert on fourth and goal, but it was, it was, it was rough. It was a lot of check downs, but without being able to go back and look at it, we have no way of knowing Did Sam play poorly Were guys not open. Did guys miss blocks up front and just didn't give him time. So some of that aspect of it, um, it, you know, there's, we just can't dig into it the way that we normally do or the way that we would like. Yeah, no, absolutely. Here's here's uh, Kate uh, Nate Kushner. See, this is what I was talking about. Got a lot of people don't even know. Twelve bucks to get in. Mm -hmm. you know, that's a steal. I mean, you know that that's one thing. It's like, yeah, I mean, like you said, you mentioned ten thousand. I mean, it, it even if you're just not doing anything, come down a lumen. Like it's just talk about every time. I mean, I like Dan. You probably attest to this. You've been to the more games, being a season ticket guy. I, it's just one of the. The better stadiums in the league no matter how many times you go you've been there you walk in that stadium and you're just like you know not i mean i, I don't know if i want to say in awe but you just appreciate how nice of a stadium this is to watch football in and and so like you know, 12 bucks right yeah that's why you say 10 i mean more people knew i mean it, you could pack it just to just to hang out and watch a few guys warm up you know like i was watching one thing i saw was cool was was reek and uh spoon you know, doing some one-on-ones, right? Uh, Reek was lined up at receiver and they were just doing get-offs and it was, uh, you know, just just stuff like that where you normally, you, you might not get to see it because, you know, if you come to regular season game, we know how pricey they can get. You might be in the upper bowl here. You get to go, you can get down in the second row if you get in there early enough and just kind of hang out. They don't really, and they, they're pretty nonchalant about getting in your seats until later and until, you know, people start getting in there. But, right. you know, that, that, was, that was cool. So you can just kind of get in there and kind of look around and say, hey, here's something cool going on here, here, and just, in that stadium man uh right let's bryce you got one right yeah, yeah 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 i got one here i mean i know you touched on it but uh nate just real quick again sam looked like game. i know dan you just touched on it but it, it's tough to get get a feel obviously yeah. gino didn't play he's he's got the small injury but what did you guys see bryce did you see anything different from sam what was your takeaways from somehow of that practice 
So it's funny because, you know, I work with quarterbacks. I coach. I'm an offensive coordinator. The thing with Sam, and to Dan's point, Sam, he didn't make any wow plays, which is kind of what he was known for, but he also didn't make any horrible mistakes, but he didn't move the ball. There was no consistency to the offense when he was there. And I think part of that, to be brutally honest, and me and Dan talked about this in the stands, was I think Mike McDonald's defense, that one defense is going to be better than I think we even anticipate once they fully dial it in. And I think they took things away from Sam that maybe he thought he would have down the field in shot plays. Um, and he also didn't have Tyler out there. I think we saw one rep from Tyler down, we figured, one or two maybe. One that we noticed. Yeah, there was a, he only yeah. had one target. And we just didn't so, see him out there a bunch. Yeah. And, and then listening to Mike McDonald today on 710, he did an interview with Mike uh, Salk and Brock Hewart. And the way he talked about Sam to me tells me that, like he said, Sam's a gamer, but there's still areas he needs to work on and improve, which to me, I get the feeling because Mike McDonald seems to be a pretty straight shooting coach. He's not going to kind of beat around the bush and stuff is right. I think they're expecting more out of Sam Howell and he's not delivering right now, which I think this preseason, I think there's a very good chance that if somehow PJ Walker pushes or makes this more of a competition than they thought. I think there's a chance that, you know, maybe we carry three because they don't trust Sam to fully be the two if Gino goes down. So I had this conversation just a couple of hours ago because I had Brian Nemhauser of Hawk Blogger on my show today. And, and he's, he's there every day now. He's a credentialed reporter this season. And, and I asked him that, you know, what the, the perform, he was really hard on Sam uh, for his performance in the scrimmage. And, and you and I don't think necessarily in the moment there thought he was playing poorly as, as, as you just attested to, it was just that he never really had a chance to set his feet and get a lot of time and pat the ball in the pocket at all. And maybe in a game situation, he would have done better. There were a couple times he took off scrambling, but they blow it dead right away. They don't really let the quarterbacks run. And he's we've seen him do that. He did it to us last year, you know, and it resulted in some long gains. He did have maybe the best throw of the day, that deep dig route to Jake Bobo uh, on, the, on, on his best drive. But it's just – it's hard to gauge where he's at right now. And then you listen to McDonald talk about him, and he sounds a little ambivalent. And Brian said something really interesting on the show today. He said, if, you know, if, if Gino got hurt week three, you know, he gets banged up in the second quarter or whatever, they'd go to Sam. Sam's the number two guy. But if Gino was going to miss extended time, eight, 10 weeks, a season ending injury, he thinks at some point PJ Walker would be the guy to play over Sam Howell, that he might be a little bit more equipped to help the team win right now i thought that was interesting especially in light of the fact that um he didn't even think that he would probably get a, a 53 man spot which is what you were alluding to that that i'm not so sure if if you're not sure about your backup quarterback and you have a third quarterback that started some games and won some games in the league something the seahawks haven't normally done their third quarterback is usually a throwaway kind of afterthought extra arm you know scout team guy that they hide on the practice squad but not anyone with starter upside that you know, maybe they'll if they get any indication that other teams might be interested in Walker at the cutdown, they might have to. He might be at least on the initial fifty-three if that's the way they truly feel. Yeah, I mean, we talked about it. You you need that viable backup in this league now. Like you said, you go down, you got a squad, and you don't have confidence. You know, you're not going to just throw. You don't just teams look at that now. Is is and I think that's why they brought Sam in because they felt if he went down. He could come in and and you know keep this thing afloat and and keep them you know go two and two or four and four whatever you need be but if if you're lacking that confidence and PJ Walker has experience in this league and and you've seen that where he's come in and kept teams competitive so you know it's interesting because you know obviously you're still we still got ways to go here we got preseason but not not a great start for Sam I let me say this though because I still guys 25 years old. Exactly. I, I still think he has, I still believe in his upside. I still think that he can be a starter in this league and still potentially could be the next long-term starter for the Seahawks. It's just that his performance in camp hasn't been consistent day to day and hasn't been such that it's really instilled 
a lot of excitement in people. However, we we aren't sure about this offensive line and the performance and their performance up till this point. They we may be seeing a dominant defensive front on the other side of the ball that they're having to go up against every day. And in the one on ones that you talked about. I thought Sam looked fantastic. I thought that's where he really shined. You see the arm talent. You see the accuracy. I think he came out by my notes. His first six or seven passes were essentially perfect. There was one that was dropped by Bobo that would have been a nice catch, but it was placed perfectly given where the defender was. I thought he looked really sharp there. You can see the talent. And he is a guy with mobility that may have been able to make some plays on Saturday had it been live bullets. So, you know, I, I just wanted to say that I hope people aren't listening to this and, oh, geez, they, you know, this is Charlie Whitehurst all over again. You know, people are giving Schneider too much credit for his quarterback scouting ability just because he got one right. I mean, this Sam Howell still has, I think, tremendous upside. He just isn't having a good camp. Well, and I think part of that, Dan, I agree with you. And we talked about it at the uh, the fan fest there was. I look at Sam Howell and I go, he's kind of in that Alex Smith world right now where Alex Smith started his career with the 49ers when he got drafted. He had three new OCs in three straight seasons. Sam Howell's basically gone through that same thing. He had one OC his rookie year, Eric Bieniemy last year. Now he's on to Ryan Grubb. And I think part of the thing that may be contributing that struggle a bit is Ryan Grubb, there's nothing really to pull from Ryan Grubb in the NFL right now where – you know, sometimes these quarterbacks switch teams and, oh, yeah, I understand this terminology because my coach ran it. He comes off the Andy Reid tree or whatever it is. Yeah. So I think we have to kind of, again, temper our expectations of what Sam Howell is. This is really a learning year for Sam to be the backup. We all have expected Geno to be the guy. And from all accounts in training camp, Geno's kind of really embraced this new role. And I think Geno's basically playing for his extension now. Because I think that's going to be a viable thing. And listening again to McDonald's press conference, or not press comments, but his radio show with Mike and Salk today, he even let it kind of slip. And I caught it and went back and heard it again. He even said, he's like, Gino's the guy. Gino's our guy. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, that's a different tune than you had X amount of months ago where it was like, yeah, like Gino's the guy. But when he said he's our guy, yeah. And that's our guy. That really, to me, kind of cements, okay, I think Mike McDonald's now coming around to Geno being a more than a stopgap quarterback for his team and for the Seahawks. And, and I think the preseason game environment is going to suit Sam perfectly. You know, get out there in a game situation. He's going to get most of the reps, I would imagine, on Saturday. I don't think we'll see Geno at all in preseason game number one against the Chargers, Sam will probably start, play at least the whole first half, maybe part of the second half. He's going to get opportunities, and it wouldn't surprise me if he looks really good. And as you were describing the, the different changes he's had to experience his first few years in the league, and even at North Carolina, he had offensive coordinators in and out, Liam Cohen leaving for the NFL and coming back. All That that was Drew Locke's story, too. you know. And and when he came here from Denver, we we heard a lot about his story, too, and how hard that is to have different coordinators and a different playbook to decipher every year when you're a young quarterback like, th like that. Like Geno Smith became a pro at it while he was bouncing around from the Giants to the Chargers. And, you know, some guys diagnose that better than others or, or um, you know, absorb it better than others. So, yeah, not giving up on him yet, but uh, we, we were all hoping for more, right? I, th I think as Seahawks fans, we would feel a lot better about this team's chances to, to win a bunch of games this year, knowing, okay, we like Geno, but if he goes down, we don't lose that much. I think there'd be a little more nervousness now. Yeah, my last just thoughts on that. I think, too, when you know you watch him, okay, he led the league in interceptions. He's 23. He had Eric Bieniemy, and, you know, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. He's just, you know, pass heavy and, not you know, just making him throw more than anybody. Get him over here, and he'll kind of, settle right in and, and and look good and i think maybe the expectation is a little too high but um you know kind of give him some time like you said dan i think uh he's still a young guy but uh guys given the recent brawl here at uh i guess the joint joint practice with the giants uh do you, do you believe teams should still roll these uh joint practices do you like them i would say given that what we even saw at the mock game occur and it apparently occurred again today at practice right I think there's there's a place in these 
joint practices where they, I think, actually do help because you get to go up against somebody else in a practice environment. The, these guys have been hitting each other now for all of mini camp, two weeks now into training camp. And when we were at the game, there was a pretty routine play. D. Eskridge catches an, an over route. He takes it for like 10 yards. And Marquise Blair, who's now back in Seattle, kind of, I think, was supposed to just thud. And he decided to suplex D. Eskridge, which D. Eskridge got up, decided to get in Blair's face. And then Raekwon O'Neal comes flying down from about five, seven yards away and takes a shot at Marquise Blair and just Kobe Bryant's in off the bench. And it just started this whole brouhaha at the, at the mock game. But we have to understand, like, it's a lot to hit these guys and your teammates for a certain amount of time during the day, then sit in meetings with them, then do it all again the next day. Like, there's not a lot of separation. Like these players don't just get to go home to their houses if they live in the Seattle area during training camp. They are actually all in a hotel together and they're staying there for that two week period. It isn't until they officially end training camp that these guys can go to their separate individual condos or whatever they've got or houses um, in the area. So you see these guys a lot every single day and if someone's kicking your ass and you're fighting for a job. It can kind of boil over at a point, but when you do it against another team and there's, you know, structure to it. And I know the giants had one. I think the lions had one. I think there, some of that comes back to the coaches and what the coaches are allowing to go to a point, And then it boils over. And, you know, Dan Campbell for one guy is a very player led kind of player uh, coach. And maybe he didn't wrangle it in earlier enough in the week of those practices where it kind of got away at that, that, that particular moment. So I think some of that comes back to how well the coaches kind of rein that in throughout the week. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to see it continue because it does, you know, with the practice limitations that just seem to get more restrictive every year anyway, like it makes me nervous that these guys don't go 100% enough in practice. And I, I do think it could potentially lead to even more injuries in game situations because it's just not something that their their bodies are in tune with. So you'd like to see them happen. I love the fact that the Seahawks next week are going to go to Tennessee and do this because they didn't under Pete Carroll. You know, let's find, we hear this term a lot this preseason, iron sharpening iron, right? Let's find out how we, how we do going against another team. You're tired of playing against each other every day. Um, I hope so. You know, brawls are going to happen. I, I like Bryce said, even they happen within teams because they just get sick of each other after a couple of weeks of training camp. So um, let's, yeah. let's hope so. I, th I think it's a cool tool. And I think if we're talking about an 18 game season and cutting the preseason back to two, then I think you're going to see even more of these because teams, you have to try to at least simulate game situations as much as possible to be ready. Yeah, that's what it's all about. And, and you brought up Tennessee um, just for. For people that don't know, they got a couple of safeties over there that uh, were playing for us. Okay. So they got D Diggs and Adams. They just signed Diggs. Uh, so, you know, that's a joint practice that I wouldn't mind seeing, right? So like you right. said, it's 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 football, right? It's the NFL. These guys are, you know, ultra competitors. So brawls are going to happen. Fights are going to break out in practice. I think, you know, Bryce, we touched on that. That's You want to see that kind of stuff within your team sometimes. Like that. that is, you know, we're going hard. That means we're going hard to practice. You know, and we're mm -hmm. we're we're going at each other. You're not you're not my friend here. I'm trying to make this team, and things are going to happen. That's just that's just what happens when you got that many guys in the field, and that much testosterone going around. And and it's it's not a big deal, you know. And uh, you know, obviously, you don't want any cheap shots or guys getting seriously injured. But you know, like you said, that's going to happen. So your joint practices are good. And like you said, it, you just these guys need more game situations. I mean, like, you know, I always talk about, you know, week one of the NFL, I just would not want to bet on it. You, you just don't know. You just, the teams aren't, you know, the chemistry's not there. Like you said, how how many reps is Geno getting in a preseason or, or starters alike, right? So it's, uh, you know, more, more simulate and more game like stuff practicing against different guys. It's, I think it's great. So uh, yeah, keep, keep them going. Um, any concerns with the defense relying on quote unquote obnoxious communication, noise level hindering that process? I guess, you know, when we're uh we're at home here. Um, I look at that, it, it, at least listening to McDonald and what he said, and even Dirty said, I think, in his press conference, like that's a big thing that they're driving home right now is the communication factor. So it's all dialed in 
So come playing at home, you're not necessarily relying on that obnoxious communication. It's just guys see things. And that's the one thing I think I've heard McDonald say, and Dan, maybe you have as well, where he's basically said like, the reason we're struggling a little bit is guys aren't seeing the same thing. So we've got to get them all dialed in. So when they see this, they see the same thing and know how to immediately adjust to what they're being shown by the offense. So I think that's something that we'll see as the preseason goes is them getting kind of dialed into that process. And I think he'll have a plan. They'll have hand signals and other things. You know, you talk, you listen to McDonald talk about how, and, and I, I've heard him talk about this numerous times and I still don't really understand it. And my brain just can't wrap around it. How he takes these, all these complex adjustments that the defense has to make before the snap of the ball. And he boils them down to one word at times, right? We've heard him talk about that. Like, well, we'll, we'll just make that one word. That'll be much easier. Um, Ryan Grubbs talked about that on offense too. Somebody referenced that when they were watching one of the hard knocks, New York giants episodes where, Dable was going over a bunch of stuff uh, with Jane Daniels and uh, and how, man, that's that's wordy. That's like old West Coast offense stuff, right? It's like, well, we'd boil that down. And it, so he'll have a plan. I'm, I'm really not that worried about it. I, I hope, I just hope it's an issue because I think if this team starts playing defense again, that home field advantage we remember at Lumen Field that has not been the same the last few years, uh, I think is going to return. And, and give that that gives our defense advantages. You get that extra kind of half step, getting off the snap and causing problems for the offense. So uh, I'm I'm sure they're they've got a plan in place. Yeah, I mean, I've said it before, right? Is it coming into our house used to mean something, and it, you kind of, you know, it just is, has not been that same feeling. So, like you said, that's a good problem when the cat crowd's going crazy and it's hard to hear. And then, like you said, they're they're going to Mike, Mike's, you know, I mean by all accounts, one of the smartest minds right now in, in the game by a lot of people. So he, he's going to have that dialed in. I, man, I'd love to see Seattle and hard knocks. You know what I mean? I'd, I'd, I'd love that. Have you heard anything about I heard something that they were approached uh, before. Have you heard anything about well, that? This year they yeah. wouldn't have been eligible because uh, first year head coach. Right. Um, right. I, I know that there were lots of reports that in the early Pete Carroll era, they were reports to, uh, approached a couple of times, turned them down, and then the mm-hmm. league put the rules in place where if you're in a certain situation, you can't turn them down. Um, I don't think they've. I think since they put those rule, rules in place, they've never been eligible. They've never been one of the teams even that could be considered for it. So, but maybe those rules don't apply to like the off season stuff. And so, you know, who knows? Maybe, maybe, or the mid-season, the Amazon thing. Right? Well, no, it's mid-season. Now there's three hard knocks, right? There's off-season no, and they're, mid-season. They're so, so maybe so those good. are different rules. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it wouldn't how, surprise how far, me. How far, did you, how far did you get into, uh, did you guys finish receiver? Or, Dan, did you finish that uh, I think I'm series? three episodes in. Yeah, I kind of yeah. got off track. I have not, and I haven't finished the final episode yet of uh, the Giants hard knocks. Yeah, I'm like three episodes right, in. Bryce, you get into receiver? I got into like the first two and then kind of at that point, Seahawks training camp news started kicking up. So it kind of right. completely derailed me from finishing it. And then I've kind of just been focusing on that. Like I go through and watch different Seahawks podcasts and stuff yeah, throughout the sure. night and just kind of don't really, I haven't got back into it. So maybe that zero week before the regular season, I might try and finish yeah, it off. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm just so Doving in right now to this, but uh, I'm going to throw a question up on here that was asked. Mm-hmm. So this is from Eric. He was going to ask about the Hawks veterans and adjusting to the new ways, but other than Dickinson or Dixon, I should say, our punter, are there any long-term veterans or how are, are there any long-term veterans? Realistically, I guess Cross would be considered a long-term mm-hmm. veteran now under this new regime. And Well, you got Tyler. Tyler. Tyler's yeah, about he's... the only one. DK, like, there's not yeah. a lot. They're a pretty young overall roster. Like, Gino would be one because he was a backup right. for two years before Russ left. Um, yeah, there's there's not a lot on this team. But the thing that I think I've heard from guys is, to answer your question, Eric, is the guys are buying into what Mike McDonald's teaching and how he's coaching this team and especially the rest of the coaching staff. Like, he said it today, like, he'll go into a coach's you know meeting and they'll address something that they're seeing on the field 
and they'll come back out the next day and rep it again. And he calls it, they keep chasing it. They're chasing the edges. And so he's like, if there's something these other coaches and players have brought up that they want to keep working on, we keep working on until we get it right. I think that was something that was missed with Pete a little bit. I think there was a lot more the expectation of the players to be able to just pick it up and go kind of a thing and get the hang of it. And, and that's the one thing I would say, you know, going back to the mock game that we saw is that, you know, there was a lot of teaching still going on in that mock game of – you could even see it on the sideline with Scott Huff and the O line, especially like him talking them through what the defense was throwing at them and how to properly set themselves up for it. So, um, you know, it was, you know, I think it's a lot better for the Hawks in a lot of ways, especially with the younger players that are now on this roster. And speaking of the roster, a little bit of breaking news because uh, this came out in the last twenty five minutes. So I think you guys probably started your live before it did, but the Seahawks have a. Uh, Released their first go. depth chart of training camp. Their first unofficial depth chart. Did you guys get a chance to see that before you went on? I have. I was actually going to bring that up on here because I did get to see it. Yeah. Kind of interesting. Some of the, especially on offense. Now I'm um, glad to see it because it gives me a chance to to redeem myself. Last year I did a show reacting and it, like immediately to the to the depth chart, and I I'm not the only one that made this mistake. There was a lot of confusion. So you know just to give myself a little bit of a break, but I read it wrong last year. You know, if it goes left to right and then it goes up and down. Right. And if you read, like if you take a position group where there's a bunch of guys at like wide receiver and you read it, you know, right now, I wish I could put it on the screen, but it says, you know, Tyler Lockett at one wide receiver, Derek young. And then right under Derek young is Hayden Hatton. And so your, my brain wants to go there first. Like, oh, you're reading the depth chart left to right, right? And in college, a lot of times they'll have or. There you go. So you see that, see how Hatton's under Young. So last year, I thought there were some really surprising things, and that would have been a good example of it, where the the way you're supposed to read it is Tyler Lockett, Der Derek Young, Cody White, and then you come back to Hayden Hatton. And well, and that's like you're saying, Dan. You look at it, like when I first looked at it quickly, I went, whoa, George Halani's jumped Kenny McIntosh, yep. which exactly. wouldn't actually surprise me, to be honest, because that I might be one. Was, yeah, that might be happening. He Halani pretty, had, a, uh, had a couple electric. of plays that stood out today, I guess. Yeah, he was quite electric in the, in the mock game. And even today I heard he ran over, uh, I think it was during one of the radio shows I was listening to. I think it was Greg Bell's show on KJR. And he ran over Nehemiah Pritchett, like completely yeah. ran him over. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I look at this and, you know, they've got Olu set up here and Nick Harris and they've got Jalen Sundell as a yeah, right as tackle, a tackle. But we both know he's in here somewhere. Yeah. He was um, one of the guys that kind of stood out to us on Saturday. Well, yeah. And so like, this is from Bob Condota's Twitter, but if you go to, you know, there's the offense, um, defense you know you kind of look at it this way um this is where i kind of find an issue obviously cameron young is still on the pup list but i think matt Go godell's got a good chance of making this team mm -hmm. um you know and you got your your secondary here mike jack trey brown now this is where it's interesting that lance boykin as a court as a corner excuse me is ahead of nehemiah pritchett i didn't really see anything from boykin that screamed like he's gonna make the fifty-three man roster, but you know, yeah. again, who knows? And then there's Kobe Bryant, which we've said he's now listed as a free safety, which yeah. is interesting. And Julian Love, who both last year under Pete Carroll were strong safeties. Yep. yep. So that's really a, a interesting. kind of interesting change. And just even this thing, you've got the rush position right. now. Which yeah. is very there's a new position we didn't know about. That's one of the first things that popped out at me. Well, that and then they list uh Chenna as a Sam. Right, which I'm kind of like, oh, that's interesting. So like Draymond Jones is ahead of Boy Mafe in this setup, and and again, this is an unofficial depth chart that they've released, just so all the listeners can understand that. But yeah, and then your special teams is right here, which mm -hmm. Lavishka Chenault's listed as the number one kick returner, with D. Eskridge as the number one punt returner, which I found kind of interesting. So yeah, yeah go back to the receipt, oh, and then they've got where is Eskridge? So, but yet they've mm -hmm. got Eskridge as the third oh, sure. X. Yes. Assuming, you know, that's DK spot. That's the X position in Ryan Grubb's offense. So, yeah, then Metcalf, Bobo, Eskridge. But here's the thing, and we've talked about this quite a bit. 
they routinely start the season with six receivers on the, on the roster. And there have been years where they keep seven. And if they're going to keep a receiver as their primary, one of their primary returners, they could keep seven. Yep. Well, and, and here's think, another and one. you think real quick, okay. and you think it could be D maybe because I mean, he, he was there returning kicks and looked okay yeah. there for that little short stint before. And then obviously injuries have plagued him before. So, I mean, maybe yeah. there's a guy where you say, Hey, you know what? They still has talent obviously in, in that spot. And, guys go down and he's just that guy with now some experience and years under his belt here and it wouldn't surprise me if he he still makes the squad right you know what's interesting to me here so curtis allen who is on rob state and show he's one of rob's guys for the seahawks draft blog he's his cap guy but he's been out at a lot of the training camps and the one thing he said even during i think it was the mock game he was at it about aj barner he said aj barner doesn't move fluidly he moves very lumbering yeah and so i was kind of thinking about and then when you look at this unofficial depth chart it goes noah fat pharaoh brown okay we kind of expected that tyler maybury brady russell who got a lot of run actually the true tight end at the mock game yeah then aj barner then jack westover and i even thought jack westover looked better than maybury and barner at the mock game so i wonder if they look at westover and, and i can't remember who i was listening to they were talking about Westover. I think it might have been Softy saying that he's kind of got that Kyle Juice Check or Use Check vibe that they mm-hmm. have down in San Francisco, where he can play a little bit of full, he can split out a little bit, he can play tight end. And you know, even the Harbaugh's are used to having a guy like that. They have um, oh, I can't remember their fullback down there. I think it's Ricard is his name. Um but they've always had that type of role on their team. So I wonder if there is a role for Jack Westover on this team in that situation. Yeah. I, the tight end thing is, is all over the place. You know, like we, I didn't notice Mabry at all. He didn't catch my eye at all. I wonder though, if there were a couple of times he was out there and maybe we weren't sure if it was him or Pharaoh Brown, um, you know, 85, 86, not sure about that, but Brady Russell's role did, it was one of the first things that we noticed, I think, is that he got a lot of run with the ones and the twos. And he he yeah. seemed, again, I didn't notice Mabry out there, but to my eye, he seemed like the third guy up behind Fant and Brown. So it's interesting to see that Mabry's listed ahead of him here. Maybe, you know, maybe if it's close and it's a tie like that, they just go with someone's tenure and Mabry's been in the organization longer. But uh, interesting stuff. Yeah, hey, uh, I know we haven't touched on it yet. You know, obviously looking at the depth chart, it looks like uh, we're real close with with Connor Williams here. Uh, hmm. What, what's yeah? Is it look like it's a done deal from what from what you've heard or, or Bryce? What are you hearing? Because uh, so, I know we we talked about that last week and it <laughs> sort of went quiet there for a bit. Yeah, but uh, man, I, and, and we'd all be excited. Yeah. What, what are you guys hearing? What's the latest right now? So. What I think happened, and I don't know, Dan, you might feel differently. I think they looked at that mock game and went, we've got a problem that we need to solve with somebody that can come in and be the guy to actually solidify that interior. Because we saw it, and you know, some other people saw it differently, but what me and Dan saw was the first time they went to 11-on-11 11 11 and drive and move the ball, Nick Harris was the starting center with Bradford and Lincoln Tomlinson and Fant and Cross at the two tackle spot. And me and Dan kind of were like, well, that doesn't make sense. Like, where's Olu? Olu's supposed to be the guy that they've been talking about a little bit here and there. And then you saw Olu come back out with the second group. And then the second time the starting O-line went in, Olu was out there. Yeah. And the the center for me, I thought that did the best. And again, he was going against twos and threes was Jalen Sundell. Mm -hmm. Like he actually looked the most comfortable in the position and in running what Seattle wants to do, especially calling out protections, calling out IDs um, and all those sorts of things. But to get to your question around with Connor Williams. So I'm looking at Corbin Smith here, who is a really trusted reporter with the Seahawks runs a great podcast locked in uh, or locked on Seahawks. So what he said is per his agent, the Seahawks are in deep discussions to upgrade their offensive line as they continue to negotiate with Connor Williams and then he put, adding to this per a source, it would be a major surprise if Williams isn't a Seahawk by the end of this week. 
They're still hashing out guaranteed money, and it's looking like a multi-year deal with the cap situation, which is kind of what I figured. But again, Connor Williams is only 27 years old. He's not some 30-plus-year-old center. Like Connor Williams could be a piece of this offensive line for the next three or four years if he stays healthy. I mean, how long have we been looking for a center, right? And and right. and then you add that to yeah. the near misses, right, in the draft, and uh, yeah, you know, you go back. Well, I don't even want to talk about twenty twenty. We we all know about Please the guy. Know. That, we know we know about the guy that went to Kansas City, right? Probably mm-hmm. the best center in the yeah. NFL now that, that Kelsey is retired and. Um, and even uh, last year, you know, they ended up taking Ola Watimi in the fifth round, and Schneider spoke highly of him, and he was a very decorated college center. And I've been bullish on him. I, I think he has yeah. a ceiling a, a, as an NFL starter. Anyway, he has that kind of upside. He just doesn't have a dynamic athletic profile, and and Williams does. But even in the draft last year, Schneider talked after day two in particular about some upsets and some guys they missed out on. And when you see where some of the other centers went that were more athletic, Joe Tipman and Ricky Stromberg were a couple that come to mind that I I thought even then that that might have been who he was, he was referring to where a lot of other people thought it, it might have been defensive tackles. And I and I do think uh, Keanu Benton was a guy that, that might have been in that discussion too. Um, and that Ola Watimi was a fallback plan. Like, we got to get a guy... Let's let's address it, and but that was a different staff and a different scheme, and and if Ryan Grubb really wants to run outside zone, you got to have an athletic center, a guy that can get out and move, and guys like this just aren't available on the open market in August ever, and the only reason that he is is because he tore his ACL for the second time in his career. I think it's the other leg. I don't think it's yeah. the same ACL twice. Otherwise, this guy, and, and this was, so I, I went and listened to the podcast this morning that Drew Rosenhaus, his agent, was on in Miami where this news broke from, and it was Rosenhaus saying he's, negoti- he's negotiating with Seattle right now. He said, there are some other teams, and then it came out later in the day that he met with the Ravens today, um, but that he expects him to sign somewhere within 48 to 72 hours that he'll be ready to play week one. It's the most miraculous recovery from an ACL that he's ever seen. If Connor Williams hadn't been hurt, he would have signed a top of the market, significant long-term deal with someone this year um, because he was coming off of potentially an all pro season. I think he was uh, top of my head. If I can remember, I think he was according to PFF, he was fifth overall. And then he was fifth in run blocking and seventh in, in pass block efficiency. I yeah. think I might have those flipped around, but he was top 10 in every category. He, when he signed with the Dolphins, they moved him to center exclusively after he played mostly left guard. In Dallas, he was much better center than a guard. So this is a guy that's only available because of injury. And so that's why it's taken so long. It's complicated. Rosenhaus said he was about to sign a lucrative contract extension, right? He's going to throw that out there. That's his negotiating angle is oh. like you're getting a potential all pro and the Seahawks are coming back with, well, how can we trust that he's going to be healthy? So Corbin following that up with, you know, multi-year deal makes sense, not just for cap hit implications, but because it's, it's your best way to give the player and the team, you know, protection where they both feel comfortable. And Williams has a chance if he stays healthy and plays well to make a bunch of money because I, as much as, you know, some people, I, I get this from fans all the time. You guys are probably here too. Well, that means we wasted a draft pick. We we failed on the Oluwatimi pick, right? A, that's not how I ever look at the draft. Best guy wins. I don't care where you find him, right? McClendon Curtis may be proving that to us right now. And B, again, guys like this just aren't available very often. And if you can get a guy in his prime just turned 27 in May, I think, and he is truly healthy, sign him. Let's lock down that position for the first time in God knows how long. Yeah, well, and I agree. So real quick, I, I agree with that, exactly what you said. I mean, I'm I'm all for a multi-year deal because if he's passing physicals and we've went 10 years without knowing who our center is, why not? You know, like, you know, if the numbers fit and, and you believe that we need a center in here, Give him a three-year deal or whatever whatever the numbers are. I mean, that's something, like you said, his agent and the Hawks are going to work out. But I'm I'm just getting tired of not having an identity at that position and and, and a leader in, in the middle of that line. 
it, it, we keep bringing up Max Unger, you know, and if, if Connor Williams doesn't work out, I mean, it is what it is. At least you, you, you went for it. And like you said, yeah. 27, he's in a primer's career. He passes physicals. ACLs guys come back from all the time. So I'm all for it. Yeah, Bryce, go ahead. So the thing for me with it too is, is like, I don't look at it as a failed pick with Olu. They took a, like your fifth round and, and later on, like you're trying to see if you can hit on a player. Like it's almost UDFA, but with a pick. It's not really like we're, you know, when people go and they'll talk about, well, we got Richard Sherman in the fifth and Cam Chancellor. and Yeah, and those were, how many Cam Chancellors have come out of the fifth round since? How many Richard Shermans have come out of the fifth round since? It's it's a it's a crapshoot. And so if the Olu pick doesn't hit, it doesn't hit. But I don't look at it as a wasted pick. Um, in regards to the Connor Williams thing, the thing with the Baltimore thing that's kind of interesting, I don't know if a lot of people pay attention to Baltimore, obviously, because they're not the Seahawks, but... Baltimore has an all pro center in Linbaugh. Yeah. yeah, I'm it's looking there. at that right now. So, like, I think the Baltimore talk of, hey, he went to Baltimore today, again, is Drew Rosenhaus being an agent and trying to drum up the interest. I think Connor Williams is going to be a Seahawk, probably, because I think John Schneider probably is tired of having the offensive line be a kind of turnstile in the middle. And exactly. even Mike McDonald said today, it's an open competition at center. Well, there's your kind of big thing is clearly the center position is an issue. It hasn't been solved yet. So we need to go and address that and fix it. I don't feel like you're going to see the bargain shopping that you used to see a lot with Pete Carroll in trying to do these reclamations. I think it's like, Hey, there's a good player. Go get him. Go get him. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the Ravens don't scare me as a competitor if they are for that reason. I think if you're, Connor Williams, you're playing center now, right? That's that's where you've had your greatest success. And the positional versatility might appeal to some teams, but I would think the player would prefer to play center. And, you know, those were the conversations. Mike McDonald was quoted two weeks ago after he passed his physical here during his visit as saying he would play center if he was with us. He was definitive about that. So, yeah, he's not going to unseat Tyler Linderbaum. So maybe the Ravens right. are looking at him at guard. Well, then it comes down to what does Connor Williams want to do? And, you know, they've got a bunch of young guys at guard. They have one of my favorite injured dudes in the draft two years ago, and Andrew Voorhees, the kid from USC that, that got hurt during the combine. They've got Daniel Fe'elele. They've got, shoot, their second team right guard is Ben Cleveland, who's played a lot of really good, a lot of good reps in this league. I, I don't think that that's a legitimate contender for Williams. And, oh, by the way, uh, the Ravens are second to last in the league right now in available cap space with just $5.4 million. The Seahawks are over $10 million now after the love deal. So they have more flexibility too. I, I think it gets done based on all the reporting. And I think it's a, I think it's huge news. Yeah, absolutely. Here, here's, here's one coming in. I know we just touched on Barner, uh, Malik Mustafa guy that we actually liked uh, before the draft, um, ramp and C not a fan of Barner. Uh, obviously, you know, you just mentioned the reports. What, what's your overall take? Did you like Malik? Did you think we should have grabbed him? He was out there. Um, what are you guys thoughts here on this, on this question? Throwing I don't know. Out? I think we're pretty deep at safety, you know, and, and when you look at the depth chart we just showed, and we're not even talking about Jarek Reed, who really flashed at the end of his rookie year before he tore his yeah. ACL. So, um, and you know, let's not overreact and give up too soon, just because I have a lot of respect for Curtis Allen. He, he said that it looks like Barner's running in slow motion compared to the other tight ends, but he was drafted because why? He's uh, he was one of the best blockers at that position in this draft. Yeah, he uh, I think he does have some upside as a pass catcher. He's he's long. He's tall. He's also the youngest player in the draft at the tight end position. One of the youngest players overall, so he has more room to grow and develop. Um, he wasn't drafted to be Noah Fant or that type of tight end. More of a Will Disley type, right? So just, you know, just pump the brakes, relax. Let's not start ripping apart day three of this year's draft and comparing it to other guys yet. Um, let's just wait. <laughs> Well, and I think the other part with with Barner too, and, and this is something I think that people miss, is his contributions at Michigan on special teams. He's a great special teams player, which 
Who's our special teams coordinator? Jay Harbaugh, who was the special teams coordinator at Michigan. So, yes, Mustafa may go out and be a starting safety where he's going to be. But, again, we have a pretty good safety room in Seattle. We needed a tight end that could come in because Farrell Brown's really only on a one-year deal. And I think they're looking as A.J. Brown going to be the guy that steps in next year for Farrell Brown. Um, I've got one here from a from Peter, and I'll throw us up on here. Drew has to go, um, you know, for his client. Not sure he'd get a huge contract anywhere. That's the very little interest, and the league isn't full of great centers. And this is kind of what we talked about just now with Connor Williams in a way is there isn't a lot of homes right now for Connor Williams to go. Most teams have settled on their center position. Yeah. except Seattle being one of them where it's still an open competition. He's got guys that, you know, he knows that are here in Seattle, Jerome Baker being one that he played with last year in Miami. Um, so, you know, I, I do think Connor Williams ends up being a Seahawk probably like they said in the next 48, 72 hours, I think they get him in. He probably won't play the first preseason game, but I could see him playing in the Titans one to get himself kind of situated in the, the role. Well, and here's, this is interesting too. I think if people think, if, if this news makes anyone nervous that we're going to overpay for this guy, we're going to pay just pay too much for this guy. Um, I'm trying to look at it here on uh, over the cap. But I looked at uh, I looked at this the other day. Centers aren't making that much money. They're they're not one of the they're not making as much as guards these days. No. So shoot, who knows? Maybe Williams does want to sign as a guard with someone because they they actually make more money. But for some reason on over the cap here, I remember here we go. Uh, current APY. So Lloyd Cushenberry. Uh, with Tennessee Titans, his new deal, he's 27 years old, same age. His APY is 12.5. Um, and then Corey Lindsley, who's uh, – has he not officially retired yet? I thought he was – I thought he was going to. Um, oh, that's right. He's listed as a street-free agent because they released him, but he's he's medically retired. He was making 12.5. Then it goes down to Tyler Biotish, who went from the Cowboys to the Commanders this year, and he signed for $10 million a year. So you can easily put a deal together – you know, a three-year deal, whatever. And we know that our new cap guy, Joey Lane, has different ideas than Matt Thomas did. He's not as immune or, or, or as averse to using void years and being creative that way, right? If you can do something, if Connor Williams wants to be in the top 10 centers, well, it drops down from there. There's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's only nine guys in the NFL making more than $5 million a year on average. And it drops down. That means that means two thirds of the league's making four million dollars a year or less. There's a deal to be had there, and I think it'll. When we see it, we're going to see that it's pretty reasonable. Yeah, and it, it just goes back to to what I'm saying too. It's like, you know, I don't think anybody should be worrying about overpaying for a position that we have. We just haven't had identity there for for over a decade. You know, like be excited about this guy. Don't worry about it. The, the Hawks will figure it out. I mean, I I just think. You know, if you if you overpay him a little, so what? I mean, it's not like we haven't done that in the past. You know, I mean, we you brought up Will Disley, we loved him, but I mean, talk about overpaying for a guy, right? Um, and 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 uh, so, but this guy, he's he's proven at that position. You know, we drafted Will, and you know, we we've mentioned guys that maybe were used not the right way, and and so maybe that's part of it. But you look at this guy, what he did last year in Miami. And here's a guy who just like slide him right in. So, you know, that's not something it's not like, uh, well, let's see how this guy does here at center. He's had his best, you know, best time at center. So I, I just, I, I want him in. I'm all for it. I know you guys are too. Um, oh, oops. well, let's well, go this one. First this one, one here's, here. Here. here's one by, by Nathan Byron here. Uh, do you guys see Bobo? having a bigger role in the passing game? And if so, will it take away some targets from Metcalf with sim similar skill sets other than speed for? I'm just going to say right now, no, as far as taking anything away from Metcalf. Uh, but what do you guys think about Bobo having a bigger role? I think Bobo will, and I think there's one area he's actually going to take away targets from DK, and that's in the red zone. DK red zone. seems to struggle in the red zone, and all Bobo seems to do is – find ways to catch the ball in the red zone. Like his back shoulder catch against, I think it was DJ James and Pritchett was awesome. Like his body control is unreal. And then, and that's not to say that DK is not, but you know, you listen to Bobo even talk in a recent interview, I think it was last week about yeah. what his first camp was like. 
he even said that DK was coming up to him, asking him, like, how the hell are you getting so open? Like, you're not faster than me. Right. But Well, he's and, one of the slowest receivers in the league, to your point, right? And, and, well, but and that's here's a guy thing. running five flats and still getting open and, and bringing DK right. saying, hey, dude, what's your secret so, here? Yeah, and so, like, my comp for Jake Bobo, and it's been from day one since he showed up last year, was he reminded me of Joe Jaravicious. Joe Jaravicious was never a burner in the NFL. But Joe Jaravicious was amazing at route running, understanding the defense, and getting into those windows. Like Dan talked about Sam Howell's dig throw that he made. Who was it to? Jake Bobo running a perfect in-break right behind the linebackers. And the ball was on the money, and, and Bobo makes the catch. And he's a pretty sure-handed receiver as well. So I don't know if he's going to – he'll have a bigger role. I don't know if he'll completely take away DK's impact, but he, I think he's going to have a bigger role in the red zone this year as a receiver than a blocker like Shane Waldron had him do last year. Yeah, agreed. I think he'll he'll work the middle of the field quite a bit too. Um, I, I could see him. I don't know that we saw a lot of it on Saturday. I, I, I can't recall. Um, but I could see him, you know – you know how McVeigh likes to use Cup as a big slot sometimes, you know, as a bigger sure-handed dude that's an easy target, uh, third downs especially. I could see Bobo being used there as well, but um, I don't think anyone's taking targets away from DK because I think he's going right. to be a focal point of this offense. Yeah, and, and when I say – when I yeah, I agree. When I said no, not, not to say that Bobo won't have a role, I agree with Bryce. Red zone, he's going to have a role, but I yeah. think, and I think we all agree – we're looking for DK to just get unleashed this year, like have his biggest year potentially with Ryan Grubb in this offense. Like you said, focal point, 1v1s. He's he's 1v1, throw him the football now. Sure looked right? like so it. I, Bryce, I, kept, Bryce kept, you know, yeah, right? tapping me on Saturday going, look, they're putting Metcalf in motion again. I think you even pointed out that at one point right. they lined him up in the backfield. And he motioned Yeah, out they, did. they did motion him out of the backfield, which is kind of a, a unique uh, – situation for that i was kind of like when i saw it i was like did i really just see dk come out of being lined up as a running back but yeah. that's the thing and that was the thing too watching i guess the the seven on seven part of it was dk never lined up in the same spot twice he was all over the place he was Great either in the left plot they yeah. had a, a formation i think dan talked about even on your reaction showdown where Farrell brown was basically next to the yard sticks and then dk was inside of him and i'm going that's two massive individuals on one side of the field. And if I'm a corner out there, I'm going, okay, how do I play this properly? Like, what, is, what am I to do with a guy that I can't really go through to get to the ball? Cause I'm just going to bounce off of him. Yeah. So here's another one I'm going to throw up here from Nate. What do you think about Diggs going mm. to the Titans? Mm. Well, it's going to make joint practice a little bit interesting now with him and Jamal down there, but well, that's what we were saying. Yeah. I want to tune into that. If, but, uh, yeah, Dan, what's your thoughts on Diggs? He, he sat around on the market for a long time. You know, guys, were, we were thinking, hey, do we do we bring him back for that veteran thing? But, you know, we talk about our safety depth getting so big now. And obviously, you know, Diggs here, you know, we weren't sure is he is he all in anymore, especially after the broken leg thing. It was like, is he the same guy? Does he want to go 100 miles an hour like we, we've seen the Diggs? Uh, he sat around for a long time. Yeah, Titans scooped him up. What's your, what's your thoughts? I just can't figure out that safety market. I mean, Justin Simmons still isn't signed, you know, and and you can talk about devaluing the position, but then there's some safeties that got paid this off season too, you know, like Antoine Winfield, and and so teams are willing to pay players that they think are valuable. And I was surprised he hung out as long as he did. I still think he has some good years left. I was never one that was clamoring for him to come back. Um, just because, yeah, you know, Mike McDonald's had so much success as a defensive coach and we've seen some of the success he's had at the safety position. Um, even, you know, we've seen what he did with Kyle Hamilton and even Gino stone, who was a, you know, a seventh round draft pick ends up leading the league in interceptions and, and getting paid in free agency. So I trusted the moves that they made there. Um, to go with the guys that they have. I'm happy for him. He wrote a really gorgeous in, in, in classic Quandre Diggs style today. A really, really nice, you know, farewell message to the Seahawks organization and the fans and name dropped everybody and Schneider and Carroll. Not every fan or not every player does that. You know, there's always there's often some understood bitterness uh as they leave. 
Um, what makes it really interesting is that he may potentially be paired again with Jamal Adams, yeah. and we'll see how that works out there. Although Adams has uh, not been practicing much with the Titans, from what I understand. I think they just recently held him out of three straight practices, and so the idea that he's finally healthy now and you know close to being the player that he used to be uh, may not be accurate. But I kind of hope it is because I think it'd be really fun to see those two guys play together certainly it would give fuel to the you know the conspiracy theorists and the and the cynics and the what if crowd out there um if they were to go play well in tennessee but you know good for those guys always good to see guys getting paid for for you know for playing well the thing for me with this is i look at it and i go you know i think it's great for quandre and i think his best years truly were in seattle for him coming out of that awful situation in Detroit. You remember listening to when he first got here and had his first year in Seattle, how much he, you know, respected Pete and John and how upfront they were. And they, you know, gave him an extension coming off the broken leg and, and all these kind of things. So I think for him, it truly was like, yes, I understand it is a business too, which is you had a down year, a new regime came in, they're going to make some changes and you had a high cap hit and you're an aging player and they wanted to get younger at that position. They wanted to pay Julian love clearly. Um, and like you said earlier, Dan, they've got some young guys in Kobe Bryant and Jarek Reed. They want to see you get on the field. So I think for Quandre in comparison to the Jamal, I think Quandre really has a lot of respect for Seattle where with Jamal, I think Jamal just, and I've heard other people talk about it. Like Jamal really how last season ended from the attacking their reporters, uh, wife on social media to yeah. leaving the field versus the Eagles when he didn't get dressed for the game. Jamal kind of burnt all the bridges leaving Seattle, I think, in a lot of ways. And it was more of a, okay, how do we get rid of this guy and get him out? And like, even in his press conference, oh, yeah, you know, all the coaches there know they can hit me up. It's like, none of those coaches wanted you, Jamal. Like, they, sh they got rid of you. So, you know, I think for him, I don't know if he even makes the Titans roster. I think, like you said, they've sat him out for three straight. I think he's, you know, minimum deal. Like, hey, we're going to give this a try and, and see and see if there's anything left in the tank kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, we talked a lot about Reek on this show in the offseason. And, and uh, you know, but then we we talked about reports and how, how Mike and, and the new staff want to maybe start using them. And uh, Eric uh, is asking us, sounds like Reek might be traveling, covering the op opposing best receiver. Or a mistake, and that's kind of what's been happening, guys. How? Uh, well, first of all, what would you see from Reek in the in the mock? I loved him. I thought that was true. Reek rookie season, but not even that. He looked so much more comfortable in what he was doing scheme wise. Like he didn't seem to kind of be guessing. Like I think he did a little bit as a a rookie and, and got lucky. Like there was one pass breakup. I think it was in the first offensive period versus full team defense when they were trying to get off their one. And Sam Howell goes to throw the short side out. And I thought Reek was going to pick it and go for six. Like he broke so fast and just knocked the ball down. And it was just like, like, wow. Like you finally, I think got the message. You can't rest on your, you know, morals and performance from your rookie year. Like you've come out to get better. And he looked even more aggressive in his jam technique and, not letting receivers get off the line. Like watching him and DK go at it when he followed DK around the field there. Mm -hmm. I, I nudged Dan a couple of times and said, hey, look, Reek's following DK left to right. And we watched it and they just had battles. Like they were just going at it down the field. And it was it was awesome to watch. I think the top three corners for Seattle this year in Trey Brown, Devin Witherspoon, and Reek Wollen, I think maybe the top three corners as a grouping in the NFL this year in this new defense. And didn't you tap me once also and notice that um, that Witherspoon traveled with DK once that he was lined yeah. or maybe not yeah that he he didn't go in motion on that play but you would notice that DK was on the left side just on one play and the right on the other and and Devin was with him right and so they're both doing it and, and it's that's so interesting to me because Pete just didn't do that. You know, you were a left corner or you were a yep. right corner with very, very few uh, exceptions over the years. And those exceptions only applied to Richard Sherman in a couple of very specific instances. But this is something we heard Leslie Frazier mention this offseason, that, that they'd like to do that with Reek in particular when he was asked about it. Um, to me, it just it, it's one of the things just plays into all the reasons I'm so excited about this defense 
And that's that as an offense, you just aren't going to know who's doing what and who's going to, who you're going to be matched up against and where guys are going. Not, you're not going to know where the blitzers are coming from. At times we saw eight, nine guys in the line of scrimmage. You didn't know who was dropping, who was coming. You're not going to know which corners are going to cover which receivers. You're not going to know which safety is the strong and which is the free. If we're showing too deep, like it's, it's so much built on deception and execution and I can't wait to see it go. So here's another one from Peter. So we were talking about Diggs there and, and him coming Ooh. to Seattle. This is a good one. I actually kind of like this. After Lynch is Diggs John's best trade. For a fifth? I kind of think it is, honestly. Like, Because Jimmy was a lot and Jamal was a lot to give up. I would probably have to say that outside of the Lynch, you know, Percy Harvin, again, was a lot of money. Sheldon Richardson, we gave up a second and a starting receiver and Jermaine Curse. Like, um, I mean, Ru the Russ trade was one of his better trades. Oh, I, yeah. think got, I think he got max value for Russ. He got max yeah. value. The timing was perfect. Yeah. Um, but I mean, if you're talking about just like, I, I mean, what you gave up, the player. The, 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 yeah, exactly. And the, the, yeah, the veteran he was and what he brought in, um, I don't know, what? It's, hard, it's hard to say, but I mean, what, I, I will I say, though, us as a whole package, just because of the fact of what we oh, got, yeah. all we got, yeah. that was definitely his, I, I think, his best trade, like you could say, ever. Here. What I'll say is, I'm going to agree for now, but I think we may have a discussion in a couple of years about Leonard Williams. I was just going to say, we gave mm -hmm. up a lot, but I think, you know, the, the context might be that you look back and, okay, he was a foundational defensive yeah. piece you know, that really allowed us to turn that things around on that side of the ball um again you don't get guys that are that good in the prime of their career it's hard to get them um but yeah i mean it's definitely one of his most underrated trades for sure and deserves to be mentioned oh leon that's a fair washington, one leon washington for a fifth michael michael fawcett just uh chimed in with that one I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I I mean, mean you're, talking about, you're talking about specialist, you special, know, specialist. Yeah. I mean, exciting at times, but uh, right. like we were saying, Diggs is the anchor there in that, in that secondary. Yeah. So I got another one here that we'll look at, and this is from Nathan or Nate again. Uh, thanks for answering guys and piggybacking to his earlier question that five or six receivers do you think they carry into September? I think there's a chance Seattle may carry seven. Yeah, if one of them's a returner, for sure. Yeah, right. with uh, the new rules. Yeah. And I think it depends, too. Like, me and Dan were talking a bit about it. I think it depends how the cornerback situation kind of shapes itself out. Um, and I think the linchpin in that might actually be Mike Jackson. Because I didn't really see him out on the field in the mock game. They gave more run to G.J. James and Boykin and Pritchett. Um, and even D Williams, who they've now converted to a DB. I got to wonder, like, is Mike Jack someone that they look at maybe tr like a team comes calling if he's not potentially going to make the roster and come calling about him? Because I don't know if they want to give up on Pritchett and James, because in my opinion, both of them actually look quite good in the mock game. Like there was a, I think it was James that made an interception in one-on-one -on -one where he broke on an out route for D Eskridge and like just, toe tap took it away at the sideline Walking. so yeah. i think there's a good chance that if the cornerback room ends up being maybe five guys or six because of your versatility with kobe bryant having been a corner uh i think there's a chance that maybe that seventh receiver comes from them not having as many corners on this roster as we were used to with pete carroll well and ultimately it it comes down to you know and and not many guys are better at this around the league than John Schneider of having a finger on the pulse of what other teams think of their players. It's about who you think you can protect or who you need to protect. It, you know, if if you're looking at, you know, seven, eight guys and and especially after the preseason games, because these preseason games are really set up for the skill guys to shine. And so somebody like Hayden Hatton goes out and has seven catches for 100 yards and a touchdown, um, you know, and D. Eskridge looks good and Aesop Winston uh, has a couple of plays like he did last preseason and really flashed. Uh, and he's involved in the return game too, or Cody White, who's getting a lot of buzz. Then if if John Schneider thinks that those guys can easily get through waivers, 
and get to the practice squad over somebody like maybe a Derek Young or uh, or a, a D. Eskridge if they really feel like he's their guy in the return game. Um, because it's it's hard to say. They, we saw all those guys do good things. We saw Cody White getting a lot of reps with the ones. We saw Hayden Hatton, Hatton have four or five you know, big-time catches. Um, we haven't seen Eskridge do much in game situations, but, you know, we could. It's, it's, it's so hard to tell. We just, we just don't know. We had a template under Carroll. You could look back to the yeah. previous year's initial 53 and the positional breakdown, and they pretty much stuck to that idea kind of every year. Um, we'll see. Guys, what player, not Gino, high on Gino, would make the biggest impact <laughs> if they were to have a Pro Bowl all-pro season? Ooh, Dan, I'll let you field this one first so I can think. Okay. I, it'd be really easy. You know, the first place my head went to yeah. is, you know, to take an offensive lineman. If Charles Cross has a big year, that's, that's probably good news for the Seahawks or one of the interior offensive linemen. Um, how about Ken Walker? Mm. If Ken Walker has a huge year, 50, you know, 1,500 yards, 1,800 all-purpose yards, 10, 12 touchdowns, then it means the offensive line was effective. The running game was, was impactful. And, you know, and he was making a bunch of big plays. So I'll go with, I'll go with Ken Walker. You kind of hear that buzz about him right now, but that's another, you just can't evaluate running backs until you see preseason games. You just can't. So I'm going to go with someone on the defensive front in the front seven. I think if Draymond Jones has a pro bowl or all pro season, I think that will actually help this defense more than we realize, because if he becomes a force on that rush position that they now labeled in their, their training camp depth chart, Think how much more teams will have to try and block up or keep guys in out of their passing concepts. Like you think about, you know, the 49ers or the Rams. They may not be able to get to a three receiver look because, well, how do we block when they come on the field? Jaron Reed, Leonard Williams, Draymond Jones, Chenna Nwosu. Like we can't do this without keeping somebody in. So now all of a sudden, Christian McCaffrey's not leaking out of the backfield as much for the 49ers because he needs to stay in and block. So yeah. um, I think that could be uh, – defensively, I think that would be a huge impact. Obviously, Geno's the biggest one that we'll all talk about because he is the focal point in the, in the quarterback position. Yeah. So, Ryan, That's what about you? I mean, I just, I just get excited when, when we're both – we're talking O-line and D-line here because, like, you know, in the seasons prior, you know, we just didn't have guys you just be throwing all these names around. Like, you know, if we get that deal done with Connor, all of a sudden you feel like – this could be a strength. You know, obviously, they all got to come together. It's going to take time. Abe's out right now. But, you know, imagine a healthy Abe, you, uh, Connor Williams, um, you know, the guy, all of a sudden you start and we you, looks like we have some depth and you get excited there. And then you start throwing out all these names on the D line. And, you know, when was the last time we were doing that? You know, 2013, 24, like, it's been a while where you had all these names, these guys where you're like, wow. And then you leave a guy, you, you forget about a guy. Like I was, we were talking about the D line and, and, and I was like, oh yeah, Jaron Reed, you know, mm -hmm. a guy that contributes and, and is a veteran dude, but you're tossing out Leonard Williams and Byron Murphy and Chenna and, and, and you, you really get excited. Um, so, you know, you guys talked about, talked about the O line and D line. I mean, I agree with you. Um, but you know, if, if Reek, comes around and you know as and kind of as high as guys are on him right now is what he's showing and has a turnaround and then you have him and spoon like bryce you mentioned trey brown you got all of a sudden this really nice room of corners maybe one of the best in the league overall uh so i i can see that changing things a lot because we were like okay what's who's this guy going to be in year three? And I think he's one of the guys that we talked about when Mike McDonald came in here, a guy that you were getting, Hey, this could be a guy because he's got so much raw talent that what can Mike McDonald do with him? 
and he was one of the guys we we talked about. So I'm excited to watch him, and if he has a big Pro Bowl All Pro season, uh, you're, you're going to see an, uh, an impact there with that defense also. So this is a good one from Peter, and actually, you know, I kind of was thinking about this myself. So, Dan, I'll ask you this. Any surprise standout players from camp like a Bobo or a Baldwin so far? I haven't really heard of anybody. Like, I could really think from what we saw in the mock game, Sundell maybe from at, in the center competition. But, like, actually, I'll throw one name out there that I think people should pay attention to in the preseason games is George Halani. I think there's a chance he really does push Kenny McIntosh for the third running back role. Yeah. I McIntosh didn't really impress me like you know last year he before his injury in the mock game apparently was doing quite well he hasn't really impressed me in camp so far from what I've seen what I've heard George Lani on the other hand seems to be the guy that's kind of taken that role and and watching him run on the weekend I think I sent it to you uh Dan was I said he looks like a mini Zach Charbonnet like I almost mistake the two mm. players yeah. because of how they run the ball yeah, it's an interesting question. I, th I think that's the thing that's missing this year. You know, we were so used to under Pete Carroll, you know, a couple of undrafted free agents really flashing every year. And, you know, there was a long run there where one made the roster every year. I don't know if there's one this year that has a shot to make the, the roster. There were guys that I was excited about when they were signed. And yet, um, you know, guys like Nelson Caesar, and they haven't really flashed yet. You know, I love me some Hayden Hatton. I just don't know if there's a spot on this roster form. I certainly think he's going to be a practice squad, squad guy, and I hope he is. Um, you know, Garrett Greenfield's a guy that I was really excited that we signed. I thought he was one of the priority free agents, and uh, they've got him at left tackle now, which I find interesting, and, and maybe he's a guy that's got a shot. But I, I think we're missing that guy. And, in fact, I, I think it was Curtis Allen, who you mentioned earlier, that tweeted today at some point that um, – because they released yet another one of those guys. They released Easton Gibbs earlier this week. There was a lot of buzz about him that a, a good portion of the undrafted guys that we signed initially have already been released. Mm -hmm. um, I think it speaks to the strength overall of the roster and uh, and that there just aren't that many jobs up for grabs. Yeah. No, that that's exactly what I was thinking about, the strength of this roster, the jobs, and you're just not even looking for that really this year. And I think, uh, that I mean, that's a good thing, right? Because you, then you, you, you're confident in yeah. like, every, you look at every position room uh and it's uh you're like well we got some depth here you look at our safeties or our corners or you know we mentioned the defensive line like you start adding it all up and there's just not a lot of room um you know it, let's let's take one more here uh by the way dan we appreciate you uh coming on hanging with us anytime with guys live stream it's it's been awesome uh um guys just before we get to this next question yeah make sure you go over to dan's channel see the hawks forever uh amazing podcast love his stuff uh, so yeah go over there subscribe um last last one here uh why do you guys think more players voted for wool and the witherspoon for the top 100 seems that maybe players really value hyper athleticism Maybe, yeah, maybe dynamic upside, you know, or or there's just a moment that sticks out to them, you know, and, and maybe there's guys that remember all those moments that Woolen had his rookie year that still stick with them, or maybe the players around the league think that he wasn't as bad last year as some of the fans and media thought that he was. Um, yeah, I the top 100 thing is always interesting, and you could really pick it apart, but then it comes back to like, well, gosh, players, players vote on it. Right, it's not like the media members who miss things all the time. Um, yeah. So for me, with the top 100 this year, I completely, at the very beginning, lost it. Lost all credibility for me when I saw Aaron Rodgers get put on there, having played <laughs> one play where he fell over and tore his Achilles. And that, to me, I don't know. I just look at it and I look at like you know, some of even the players have been speaking out against this list, being like. What is the accuracy of this? Like, don't get me wrong. I think Tyree Kill is a phenomenal talent. Do I think he's the number one player in the NFL? No, I don't. I think he's one of the best receivers, but not the number one player in the NFL. So for me, like when they first came out with this, like I, I don't even know how long ago, it might have been 10 years ago, 
there was a legitimate case being made for a lot of those guys coming out when like the Brady's and the Manning's and all that were in the conversation. Now it, to me, it just seems like it's a filler to try and get you through the last like couple weeks before training camp happens. Here's the top 100. Like, you know, I think both Woolen and Witherspoon played well last year, but Witherspoon missed a significant amount of time kind of at the beginning of the year. Yeah. Woolen had some injuries he dealt with. So I don't know. I think they're both going to be extremely uh, high rated this year. I actually have one more Dan before, or Dan and Ryan before we go. Yeah. Um, and here's an interesting one from Moto Seahawk. He goes, if we go for Connor Williams, do you think there are likely trades or cuts to make room? Eskridge, Daryl Taylor, Forsyth, or others? That's an interesting conversation because now to get him in cap-wise, there may be some of this kind of maneuvering around of, okay, do we see an extension for a DK or a Gino to make more room? Or are there cuts that we're kind of not expecting out of that list? Eskridge is maybe the only one I think that could potentially make this team. I think, you know, what I saw from Derek Hall, um, you know, Draymond Jones, you know, being out there and what he's been doing. Like, Taylor's got a real uphill battle. Didn't really see him out there. I saw Nelson Caesar quite a bit, and he looked actually pretty good as a rush edge there. And Stone Forsyth, like, if it's a, like Dan was saying, how do we sneak guys on the practice squad? I don't yeah. want to lose Mike Jarrell for Stone Forsyth when this is Forsyth's last year in Seattle. I'd rather keep a Forsyth or, or sorry, a Jarrell or a Greenfield over a Forsyth potentially. Yeah, and in some ways, that's a good point. It's easier to sneak some of those guys through at the cut to 53 because teams largely don't claim many players uh, when that happens. But no, I don't, I don't, I don't, if we sign Connor, if we wake up tomorrow and Connor Williams signs a deal, I don't think anyone of significance is getting cut to make his roster spot. I mean, you can cut Carlton Johnson and none of us will even notice. And most people will say, who was Carlton Johnson? I, yeah. You're not, you're not cutting a player who might have a shot to be a significant part of this yeah. roster at this juncture. Uh, there's, there's way too much dead weight. And I did look up that number again. I wanted to be accurate. Um, uh, six of the and this kind of goes to this point. Six of the sixteen originally signed undrafted free agents right after the draft have already been released. Like uh, this coaching staff seems to make their minds up about you, and then when they do, they move on. So, um, yeah, I don't think anyone of significance would be in jeopardy if Connor Williams signs. Yeah, for sure, guys. Uh, this has been fun. Uh, and yeah, camp rolls on. We're gonna get into you know preseason's gonna start up. Uh man, it's you know, we're gonna blink our eyes here and we're uh starting the season. So but this was this was an awesome show. Appreciate everyone kind of chiming in here, throwing your questions out. Uh we couldn't get to every question, but uh we're gonna be uh we'll be going live again before the season starts. And uh so we welcome you guys to come back and throw the questions out to comment. And guys, if you haven't done so yet like subscribe and like i said just a few minutes ago go over to dan vegan's channel seahawks forever give him a sub and uh yeah start following his channel as well dan we appreciate you coming on hanging out with us and uh we'll be talking to you in the near future for sure always guys my pleasure all right guys we're uh signing off here and uh go hawks go hawks go hawks <laughs>